Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. So I am, as he mentioned, Brian Ackerson. I am a systems engineer at Red Hat, uh, working in Red Hat IT on the identity and access management team. Uh, we support pretty much LDAP, Kerberos, PKI, SAML, anything identity management related. Uh, so as you can imagine, our servers tend to be a point that we really want to secure, especially the Kerberos KDCs. And on Linux, there's really only Lux volume encryption that, that is feasible to do root file system encryption. But uh, as you can imagine, going around and running around typing in the, the passphrase at VM boot up is kind of a pain in the butt. So today I'm going to talk about a relatively new mechanism for solving this problem uh, that Red Hat's been working on and will show up shortly in future Red Hat releases. So the use case is, and this actually happened to us, um, our enterprise security architect came to us and said, we really, really need to encrypt everything everywhere. I'm like, okay, we could do that. So, but data centers, kind of complex, right? You have physical servers with pretty much every imaginable boot device you could think of. Um, virtual machines, not the easiest to get console on to actually type in any kind of Lux passphrase on boot. You have uh, storage appliances. A lot, a lot of storage appliances, NetApps and so on, offer kind of vendor-based solutions for, for encryption, but there's not really anything that works across everything everywhere. Not to mention that cloud thing, right? So when you start putting things in AWS or Azure or wherever, trying to encrypt your file system gets a whole lot more difficult. Um, there are vendor-specific solutions. You know, AWS has their KSM solution, um, but by design, that is there to really increase your lock-in with their service. Um, and not, doesn't really translate to running things in the hybrid model where you have services in both your data center as well as the cloud. So there's lots of options for doing disk encryption, but all of them suck. Uh, as I mentioned, there's the storage appliance vendor solutions, NetApp, uh, pretty much all the vendors have these. They have some nice benefits in that they will perform encryption after deduplication which is relatively nice if you rely on deduplication to cut down on your LUN sizes. Um, there are, of course, native OS tooling uh, mechanisms for, for pro providing uh, file system encryption, Lux, BitLocker on Windows. Key management's still a headache. Um, and then you could do some other hackish things like doing a, uh, having your, your data LUN encrypted with Lux and then storing the decryption key and the binary blob plain text on the root file system that's not encrypted, in which case, why are you even bothering in the first place? Um, and really, you get into this model where you still kind of need to escrow service, and escrow services bring you into a whole other range of problems. You have to back it up, secure the transport. It's kind of a nightmare. Um, so, and of course with escrow services, you know, if you have a data center outage, the first thing that's going to break and not come back up after a data center outage is the escrow service you need to recover the rest of the data center. So, um, so it's important to kind of take a step back and ask the question, why do we want to encrypt everything everywhere? Um, there's, of course, the regulatory and compliance uh, reasons, right? We, we, this happens to us all the time where customers want to know that we're encrypting data. Um, and so we have to show that, yes, we are. Get that audit gold star, right? Um, which, okay. Uh, then, more importantly, we want to prevent data leakage. Um, we're returning disk all the time when the disk fails in our, our RAID arrays or storage appliances. Um, backup media, you probably really want to encrypt that. Uh, protect against theft. Um, of course, you want to protect against unauthorized access, uh, both on online and offline. Online access is, is usually protected at higher levels, but on the offline access, if someone has access to, to mount the data LUN, you don't want them to be able to read it. 
And similarly, you, it's mostly about control, right? You want to protect against the unknown. And especially if you're in a multi-tenant environment, you kind of don't want other AWS customers to be mounting your data. So I can tell you what I don't want out of a, a decryption system, right? We, we don't want any kind of boot or mount time manual operator in, in intervention. I don't want to have to go run around and type in the Lux passphrase at, at boot. We don't want to run different solutions everywhere. Um, having one standardized solution for both on-prem and off-prem services would be ideal. We definitely want to avoid vendor lock-in. Um, we don't want to rely on escrow services to break during the outage, because they will. Um, and, and most importantly, I don't want to have to run a HSM or any kind of specialized hardware. Um, Although TPM 2.0 has some interesting potential, but you know, then you have these things called VMs, right? Um, and you know, mostly I don't want to sacrifice cost or uh, uptime for security. Uh, that gold star really shouldn't cost me my mental health. So really, what I want is a pony and environment-dependent decryption. So. Basically, all volumes, including the root file system, should be encrypted, and these should decrypt automatically when running normally in my environment. Outside of this environment, decryption should still be possible to, to recover this data uh, with some manu manual intervention. We don't want to have to store the, the decryption key in plain text. It's just silly. And uh, of course, we want a hardware vendor neutral solution and be able to support VMs and so forth. And we shouldn't have to build this crazy escrow system that you know, would make Rube Goldberg proud. And for please, please don't add complexity to my environment. It's already overly complex, and you know, I'd really like to know how the thing works. So to kind of meet these challenges and provide a mechanism to, to uh, perform this environment-dependent decryption, we have started the Tang and Clevis projects. These have been the result of several different iterations. Um, previous projects, DO being one of them, if you've heard of that. Um, so the, this is kind of a, a server and a client-based approach to doing this network-based decryption of your Lux volumes that, that supports doing root file system encryption and decryption. So Tang is the server. And it's more than just providing Lux decryption. It's really kind of uh, a mechanism for, for doing secure network-based data recovery. And Clevis is the host side tooling that, that works with Lux and Encrypt Setup to provide to both lock and unlock your volumes. And the, the naming comes from kind of an ancient lock, locking mechanism where you know, Clevis is the, the mechanism that goes around and you have the pin and, and so forth. So the, the Tang server. So the basic premise is that the Tang server and the client work together to calculate the Lux decryption key. Neither party can decrypt this, can, can access that Lux key on its own. Uh, and this encryption key, decryption key, is never transmitted over the wire. It's not an escrow service. Virtually nothing gets stored on the Tang server. Literally, it's two files, two, two private keys. Um, the server really knows nothing about your client at all. And it supports highly available configurations. And uh, as, as I mentioned, this works together with your client to, to decrypt the volume. And most, most importantly, this kind of a future roadmap thing that is in Tang starting to see in Tang today is it's really a framework about doing policy-based decryption. One of the, the more interesting facets of this is that you'll be able to do, uh, have user laptops, that, and those laptops can decrypt at a certain time when the user is near a certain access point. So you could do kind of cool policy-based mechanisms like that uh, outside of your data center too. So, I always butcher this name, so I'm not going to say it, but the, the MR exchange is 
a, a novel kind of mechanism to provide this, this uh, client and server calculation to decrypt the volume. It's, it's based on an elliptical curve, Diffie-Hellman, and they've added some extensions on top of that. And the, the gist of it is that the, the client and server work together to, to perform that decryption. Um, I would suggest you, you watch one of these two videos uh, where Nathaniel, who's the McCollum in that exchange, um, goes, really go, kind of goes through the, the details of the exchange and the math in, in much greater detail. So the Tang server itself, it's a, it has an integrated simple HTTP server. Note, no, it's not HTTPS. You don't have to worry about uh, HTTPS certificates or anything else. It is just plain HTTP. Uh, the, the service relies on JSON web encryption objects, JWEs. If you've, I don't know if you guys are familiar with those or not, but they're kind of a standard. And overall, the entire Tang and Clevis uh, processes conform to the, uh, the Jose standard, which is um, you know, object signing and encryption basically using JSON and throwing a bunch of uh, uh, keys and signing the whole, the whole structure. And it's a very simple API, I'll get to it in a second. It's very fast. Uh, on a simple desktop, you can, the Tang server could perform about 12, 1,200 decryption requests a second, and the limiting factor there is TCP overhead. And uh, this, this horse is from the Tang dynasty. Anyways, uh, so the Tang API, right? Simple. There, there's really, really three calls you could do uh, to get the server's advertisement as well as to post a key recovery request. You could curl and, and get the advertisement yourself um, just to see if things are working. Um, so that's kind of Tang and a high, high level I'll get to and how it works in a, a few minutes. But it's helpful to understand how Lux actually performs encryption at, at a high level to, to talk about the rest of this talk. So Lux sits on top of dmcrypt, which is a, a kernel module that, that pr provides a secure disk encryption. And Lux can support up to eight volume passwords. It's important to note that these volume passwords or do not directly decrypt the data themselves. Rather, when you run crypt setup or Anaconda, um, which calls crypt setup, it will generate a high entropy master, master key. <coughs> then when you type in your, your user volume password, your user volume password is used to then encrypt the master key, and then that gets stored um, in the Lux header. So, there's two different keys here, the master, which users never see, and, and then, the, of course, the, the user key. And you could have up to eight versions of the, the encrypted master key, so essentially eight passwords to unlock the volume. Does that make sense? Yes, no. So a typical Lux header looks something like this, where you have the header that stores encryption types and, and, and metadata about how your, your volume is actually encrypted. Following that, you have eight slots, uh, zero through seven, in which you are storing the ciphertext that results from performing that, it, per, encrypting the master key with your user password. Um, so you could have eight passwords stored here, and most importantly, between the password storage slots and the actual disk, encrypted disk contents is about 4K of free space, uh, depending on your sector size. But, so in order to be able to provide, to store some Lux decryption metadata along with the actual Lux volume, we came out with a, a wrote a new utility called Lux Meta. And so this is used to basically chop up that free space and store additional metadata in, in this free space. So you have the, the Lux header and then broken up that free space into eight segments as well, which correspond to the, the eight password slots. 
so you'll, you'll see why that's important in a second, but if you talk about Clevis, which is the, the Clevis is the client side software which interfaces with Lux to provide the, the decryption. So you have your Tang server out on the network, your, your local client, you know, server, whatever it is, starts up, it run, it's running Clevis, and Clevis reaches out to it and talks to the Tang server and then decrypt, works locally to decrypt the volume. Um, Clevis is fully pluggable um, and supports a variety of different types of Clevis pins. And the pins are essentially decryption mechanisms. They could be, you could use one with a Tang server, or if, if you want to run your own escrow service, you could do that too with just using the HTTP pin. And Clevis uses the Lux meta to store the data required for this automated decryption along with the Lux volume, which is nice. You don't have to have a separate data store outside of the Lux volume. Most importantly, we don't store the decryption key in that data. <laughs> so when you run, I'm going to kind of go through the theory of how this operates. It's considerably simple when you just run it. Um, it's one command, so I'm, but I just want to show you how that command works. Uh, so when you run Clevis, Lux bind, it generates a new random key with roughly the same entropy and key size of the master key for the Lux volume. So we generate this new key. Then we call crypt setup, which is a Lux command, to actually add this new key that we just generated to the, the next available password slot. In this case, it's slot one. So you have your, your original password that you set up as part of Anaconda or setting up uh, Lux manually, and then you have the new Clevis uh, encrypted master key. So when, can you guys see that? Uh, so when you run the, the Clevis uh, Lux bind, after it generates the, the new random key, it will reach out to the Tang server and request an advertisement and the server will respond with that advertisement in a trust on first use policy. So you choose to trust that signature that the Tang server returns. You could also load this advertisement out of band using Puppet or whatever configuration management solution you want. So you could, could set up that trust relationship beforehand. So then Lux, uh, Clevis will then generate a new binding key and encrypt your, your uh, uh, basically uh, <laughs> Clevis Lux password, the original password that you generated with this new binding key. And that is performed using ECDH uh, ephemeral static encryption, which is covered by RFC. So then we, we encrypt the binding key with the Tang server exchange key. And so this is where it's important where we then use the, the Tang server's key to encrypt our binding key so that we cannot actually access our own key without talking to the Tang server. We discard any plain text keys we have laying around and then we store all the cipher text as well as the, the server's advertisement and URL as a JWE object. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Then we plop that JWE object that we just uh, generated, and, and this is essentially the thrice encrypted Lux password in one of the, the Lux, the next available uh, Lux meta slot. And you, we put it in the Lux meta slot that corresponds with a Lux password slot so that there's this uh, kind of implicit uh, correlation between the two. Uh, we'll, we'll see this in a, a few minutes. So basically the, the JWE then sits on the Lux volume in an encrypted form. So that's how we originally set up encryption. Now your volume's encrypted, it's running, you need to reboot the server. So when the server boots up, part of the, the uh, boot process is that it, it invokes the Clevis scripts uh, that, that you include into the uh, initial init RAM disk. And now we need to recover the binding key. So upon boot, uh, Clevis is invoked. 
It then needs to, to recover the binding key. It reaches out to the Tang server. It performs a calculation there using the MR exchange algorithm we covered before. So that will allow us to decrypt the JWE, which decrypting the JWE will allow us to access the Clevis Lux password, which will let us recover the, the Lux data. And you can run Clevis up to, of course, I guess seven times to store seven different decryption keys against seven different Tang servers. And Clevis will iterate through the various keys until it finds one that actually decrypts your volume. So the recovery phase is all about decrypting the JWE that you stored to disk. And this, of course, occurs automatically at boot as part of the boot process, or there's also a plugin for GNOME. So if you have a USB disk that's encrypted, you just plop it in, and it gets decrypted automatically. So the, the key recovery steps, these are all performed automatically. Right? We, we fetch the JWE by scanning the volume and looking at the Lux meta slots, we pass that JWE to Clevis Decrypt. We find that, hey, this, this JWE was encrypted using the Tang pin, use MR Exchange to, to recover the key, decrypt it, and all is good. Uh, and at that point, you have uh, full access to the encrypted volume contents. So that's nice theory, but how do I actually make use of this? It's actually really simple. It's currently available in Fedora 24. Uh, we are working to include it in a future RHEL release. I'm not allowed to tell you which one, but soonish. Um, it's also open source, right? I, I pointed you to the GitHub pages. You can really build it on any distribution that supports System D and Lux. Um, mostly, the, the limiting factor there is the Jose libraries. So to install Tang if you, on your Tang server, you literally just install it and systemd enable it. Uh, enable and start these services. The first thing you do after enabling it is to you want to generate the, the server's public and private keys. So you just run these commands. Um, these are the only, thing that, only things that get stored on disk for, for Tang. And you're basically just giving it a curve and telling it to go generate a, a asymmetric key. So that's all that really is required on the Tang server. <coughs> to, to set up Clevis, so you would do this on the, the server that, where you want to have the actual encrypted drive. So you would install these packages, the Clevis, really just install Clevis star. Um, you have the, the Lux package, draw cut, for, for decrypting the volume at boot time, and the UDisk packages, which is for GNOME, to decrypt, to decrypt USB keys. To set up and trust, so as I mentioned, you run the, the Clevis bind Lux command, give it a path to the device, and give it the Tang server URL. That's all that's needed. So here's an example, right? You, you run it. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, you choose to trust the advertisement, or you could trust it beforehand. If this is the first time running Clevis, you'll, be, uh, you'll give it, be given a warning that, hey, do you want to initialize that free space in the Lux header? You just hit, yes, it's harmless. Um, version 2 of Lux will actually support a proper vendor metadata storage system. But in, in version one of Lux, which everyone uses, it, it doesn't really have a dedicated space for this type of metadata. So the rest of the, the command, just run clevis bind Lux, and you give it an existing Lux password that works to decrypt the volume. And this is needed in order to add the, the new key to your, your, one of your Lux password slots. On your Tang server, you'll see that, hey, we received this key post, and all is good. You could take a look at the Lux metadata that Clevis generated in that free space. And here you'll see that 
slot one is empty because that corresponds with the user password that was set up as, as when the Lux volume was originally initialized. And then slot one is your Clevis managed decryption key. Um, this UUID will be the same across all Clevis mechanisms. Um, it's really just uh, associated with the, the Clevis utility. So if you have multiple Clevis keys, you'll see the same UUID in all slots. And I know you can't see that, but you could actually take a look at the metadata that gets stored on disk. It is a simple JSON object. So you, you just um, use the Lux metadata to load it from your disk, and you can pipe it to, to the JSON tool module Python, which will format it nicely for you. And, and here you can see the algorithms used as part of the exchange and some metadata associated with, with Clevis. You also see the URL that's uh, of the Tang server that generated that you need to talk to in order to recover the, the key for this. And then a final step, after you install Clevis and do the, the Luxbind setup, just run dracut-f and that will rebuild your, your init uh, file, so it'll boot, uh, decrypt that boot after that. Um, really, that's it. So that's uh, Clevis and Ting in a nutshell. Uh, are there any questions, comments, concerns, tomatoes? Oh, go ahead. I think I, I think I might have missed, is this on? Doesn't seem like yeah, it's on, uh, oh, it is. Um, where does like policy get set for, you know, at the beginning you had like Bob uh, sits down at his computer and maybe there's Pam or something, but is that is that on the Tang server? That it, yeah, it would be on the Tang server. It's not fully implemented, but that's the direction it's going, right? Right now, Tang supports kind of the use case that, that I ran through later with just, you know, simple, you have a server that you want to decrypt at boot. Gotcha. Are there any demos of this running in the cloud environments? You said that was one of the core ideas at the start, and um, I'd be really interested in using it for automated cloud. Second question, I guess, is I'm surprised you got away with the HTTP server with the enterprise architects. Just a comment, I guess. But so use, even though everything's encrypted and everything's encrypted, usually they just go, oh no. Yeah, well, you I know, work at, I work with banks. Yeah. I mean, there, there's no reason you can't run it on HTTPS, but um, there's just no need to. It's already doing uh, essentially Diffie-Hellman exchange, which is what TLS does, so there's not really any reason. I know that. <laughs> I, I know, but... Yeah, yeah, no, but uh, if, if that's a concern, you could certainly run it over HTTPS. Um, so I think I know the answer to this, but uh, yeah. just to confirm, so when you, when you do the setup, the initial user password is still in place, so you, yes. can, you can still decrypt manually if you're off on some other network. Right, you could have up to eight passwords, one of them or right. seven of them could be Clevis passwords, but you still have that initial password that was set as part of the, the uh, setup. And so the other question is, obviously this is happening very early in the boot process. Yes. What's, what's your network environment does, at this point? Is the is Clevis doing DHCP thing? Mm -hmm. what, yeah, it'll, it'll bring up your network stack first before it tries this. Uh, and once it, it actually uh, sees your network stack up, then it will try to run the, the Clevis decrypt. But, but DHCP is clearly a requirement here then on the network. Uh, right? Yes. Because you're not, you are right. not have access to your other network config yet. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, excellent talk. Uh, so if I recall correctly, at the beginning you described a scenario where um, you know, with, with, I think you called it a, a network escrow service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your data center's down and, and everything needs the, the escrow service to be up, but of course it's, it's down as, right. as well. Um, so would, would, uh, would Tang and Clevis uh, address that or would it would be the case where you'd have to bring up, I think it's the Tang server sort of by hand first because presumably it needs to be uh, Lux encrypted as well. Yeah, so you can, it, it's, very, very light rate weight. You could actually run it on a Raspberry Pi if you want. Um, so, yes. Challenge accepted. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you would still want your at least one Tang server online, but it's considerably less complex than a full escrow service. Um, and you can also have 
uh, essentially seven Tang servers distributed across the globe. They're available if your, your local net, uh, Tang server goes down, I'll just access another one someplace else. And I'll keep iterating through all the Clevis, or the, all the Tang servers until it finds one that works. Ah, okay, I missed that part where you could have multiple yep. uh, Tang servers. Yep. If there are no other questions, then let's give our speaker a big round of applause. Thank you.